Look to the Lord, look to Scripture for inspiration this morning. Father, right now we come to you as the living word. We ask you to speak to us, just as we sang in that song, Speak, O Lord. Whenever you speak, it brings life, it brings light, it brings understanding, it brings hope, it brings encouragement. Let your word this morning speak to each one of our hearts in a special way. You know, everybody need. We pray that you will meet our need this morning according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning we are starting a series for this month called Daily Bread. And the foundational Scripture comes from Matthew 6, 9, when Jesus said, This is how we should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed or holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. So this morning I want to talk about our daily needs and God's provision. That's the focus for this month. Now, when you came in this morning, you received a piece of paper with some ink on it. It's called a bulletin. Anybody, everybody get one? Okay. How does that piece of paper make you feel this morning? What emotions are attached to that piece of paper when you receive it? It's paper with ink on it. Any emotions attached to it? Probably not too much. However, I got two other pieces of paper, and I'm going to ask for some volunteers. Katie and Rooks, come up here. You've been handpicked. I'm going to give each one of them a piece of paper with some ink on it, and then we're just going to see if there is any emotion attached to this paper. Katie, you get that one. Oops, you get that one. Now show it to the church. Is there emotion attached to those pieces of paper? Which of the two look happier right now? Okay. Paper with ink. Now that's a late wedding gift to both of you guys. So use it wisely. Yeah, we'll meet later and talk about joint finances. You can keep it's a gift. It's a gift. You can keep it. Look at the emotion attached to a piece of paper. What a great day. Now, let me side note. I'm only going to use that illustration one time this month. Okay. So don't come in here next week talking about pick me, pick me. Okay. That illustration has now played itself out. Uh, emotion attached to money. And ultimately, what I want to talk about for this month is to get us to a place where there could be less fear when it comes to money. So let me give you three scenarios that's very realistic and practical that each one of us might have encountered at different points in our lives. If you go to Food Lion this afternoon, well, let's make it last week because it was the last week of January. January was a long month. It felt like a year on its own. You know, it's like, how many weeks are there in this month? And it's the end of the month, and you were able to balance everything out, and now you have $90 cash left. That's all you got, and you're waiting for payday. You got that on your calendar. January 31st is coming. February 1st is coming. I got $90 cash. You go to Food Lion. You got to juggle everything and think carefully. You get to the cash register and they total it up, and the total is $100. Right there, you $10 short. What emotion will be attached to that? Now, I don't know if you've ever started sweating in the checkout line, but I have. All of a sudden, I need to make a plan. There's a gap. There's a need. 
and that can bring a lot of fear. Ten dollars. Okay. Let me give another illustration. Let's say you have been driving your old Jeep. You put 300,000 miles on it. It served you well. But then there just comes a time when, okay, I've prayed over this thing, and we've duct taped it enough. It's time for a new vehicle. I don't want something reliable. I don't want something too flashy. I look at my budget. I pull up there at Bull Throne, and I'm like, okay, what do you guys have? They say, well, we think this right here would work for you. $10,000. Say, okay, I think I can swing it. They say, okay, we can finance it for you right here today. They do the math and they say, good news, you can have the vehicle. We can finance it for you for $9,000. You just need a $1,000 deposit down payment. Okay, you sure? Right there, what's going to happen? Good chances you might start sweating right there in the chair. There's a motion attached. Now, it's the same emotion, it's just a different amount. We talked about $10, and now we're talking about 1000 Let's move the decimal. Somebody lost their home, and for the sake of keeping it simple, they rebuilt, they found a contractor that said, okay, I'm going to move you up on the line. I got my crew, we're going to jump on this. You working with insurance, they give you the go-ahead, but it's still kind of pending, but they start working, and they go at it, they go at it, they complete the house. They bring you the final bill. It's $100,000. You talk to the insurance. They say, good news. We can pay you $90,000. All of a sudden, there's a gap. What I'm doing is I'm giving you realistic illustrations of life, and we're just moving the decimal. Okay, So that illustration can keep going, can go bigger or smaller. But if there's a gap, if there's a lack, if there's a need, all of a sudden, it can bring a lot of emotion and a lot of fear. Same way that when, on the flip side, you find yourself being prepared to pay X amount, and you put the money aside, and you go to the store, and there's a sale, and now all of a sudden, you, you walk out with the extra $10, or an extra 1000 or extra 10000 there's emotion attached to that, right? So the goal is... To get to a place where we can deal with our day-to-day -day needs and remove the fear. Because it's very difficult to receive and think clearly when you're completely stretched out. And food line, you start throwing everything out. Or you make irrational decisions when you're driven by fear. Okay? So, with that in mind, I'm going to look at Four ways that God provides for us. Four ways from the Bible that He provides in our daily needs. If you go to the next slide there. I'm going to read a story and then I'll show you the four ways. I'm going to read it from two Gospels. This is Jesus providing for a big need. Luke 9, 11. But the crowds, crowds found out where He was going. And they followed him. He welcomed them and taught them about the kingdom of God. And he healed those who were sick. Late in the afternoon, the twelve disciples came to him and said, Send the crowds away to the nearby villages and farms, so they can find food and lodging for the night. There is nothing to eat here in this remote place. Huge crowd, hungry people, not enough provision. But Jesus said, You feed them. But we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Or if there's a bigger need here, there's a gap. We have something, it's just not enough. There's a gap, there's a lack, they answered. Or are you expecting us to go and buy enough food for this whole crowd? For there were about 5,000 men there. Jesus replied, tell them to sit down in groups of about 50. So the people all sat down. Verse 16, Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up to heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread and fish to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the 
disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. This is in Luke. We are now going to read the same miraculous provision in John. The feeding of the 5,000 shows up in all four Gospels. Then there's also the feeding of 4,000, a second miracle. But this one shows up in all four. So let's just parallel John's encounter. John 6, verse 2. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went, because they saw his miraculous sign that they healed the sick. Jesus, verse 5, soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, Where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, Even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Again, it's a cap, Lord. Big need. Then in verse 8, then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what, what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish. And they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. So I want to talk to you about how God provides for us every day has been providing and will continue to provide for you because this is what he does as our father. Four ways. And we will see it in this miracle. There's the natural way. God provides in very natural ways. It's predictable. It's It makes sense. There's the people part that we are going to look at. Then there's favor. And then there is the supernatural provision. So we're going to look at each four of those. God has been providing for you throughout your life in all four of those ways. You might just not have noticed it. Okay, so God gave me this picture as I was praying. You go to the next slide there. Of a water tank and faucets. Okay. Now, imagine we live here in town. And you're on the town system, so you get your water from the water tank. There is plenty of water in the tank, we hope, right? Now, for your need, there's a system in place where you can access that. It runs through pipes to your house, and then there are faucets in your house to control how much water you could get at different points. Now, let's say you have a Super Bowl party this afternoon, and people get really thirsty on the sweet tea, and you're like, we're running, we need more water. And you're at the kitchen, and you're like, this, it's not bringing enough water. People are really thirsty. And then somebody says, well, just go to the bathroom and get water from there also. Like, open up another faucet. There can be more water running to us. God has an abundant supply in heaven. Read about heaven, more than enough. Streets of gold. No need, no lack, no fear. And God has set ways in place for us to tap into that. So if we just think practically, a faucet is something I can open or close. There are ways in your life that God provides for you. And maybe there are ways available that you weren't even aware of. So you have the natural, the people, the favor, the supernatural. Just keep that image in mind. And now let's look at these four ways that God provides for us as seen in the story. First of all, there's the natural. So it's the very practical. In John 6, 5, there's a huge crowd that's hungry. So there's a big need. The disciples' first response that we saw in both was they just thought natural. 
Now, I think if we read the story, there's a tendency for us to dismiss that and kind of think, oh, they had no faith. But what they did is they assessed the situation and they said, we can go and buy bread. So many people, you know, it's like, I need to order pizzas for the Super Bowl party. How many people are going to come? How many slices per person? You know, let's get those pizzas ordered. They're assessing it and say, we can buy bread. Or another solution is we can go earn a salary. It's just going to take a long time. So, in the natural, there are ways. I want you to think about provision and a faucet. Each one of us in this place, somehow God got you through 2018 financially. He got you through January. And in a very natural, practical way, if you work a job, at some point, each month or each week, that faucet will open and the water will come out. That's now finances. It's predictable. Now, are there way, things that you can do in the natural for that faucet to open more frequently? Yes, you could work overtime. You can get a second job. At one point in my life, I was living in England, I worked three jobs. I was a teacher, and then a waiter in the evening, and then Saturdays and Sundays, I worked at the school center. So there were three faucets, but then there came a time where I realized I did that for about a month, and I'm like, this is not going to work anyway, so I'm going to start going to church on a Sunday at least. And thankfully, God provided where I didn't have to work three different jobs. But in natural ways, there's a big need. I think it's okay to just sit down and say, what can we do to make ends meet? We can buy or sell something. We can work. I don't think this miracle dismisses that. Because as a church and as a pastor, I've often met people who have a huge need but it seems like they're only waiting for the supernatural part. It's like, okay, how about, is there anything you can do in the natural that's very practical, ways that you can find a little faucet to open for some income? Look at the next slide there. Another natural, practical way um, that the disciples say, we have a big need, lots of people. But this is what we have, okay? What is in your hand? Do inventory, practical. What do I have? Because it's like this. I came to America with one suitcase of clothes, okay? I've been here for 15 years, and now for some reason, it took eight trucks and four trailers to move everything. What? One suitcase. And then this past week, I took two truckloads of items that we donated. It's like we need to purge a little here. Okay? So what's in your hand? What's in your house? What do you already have? Sometimes it's there, but we're so overwhelmed by the need that we don't realize you always have something in your hand. And then another very practical way that God provides, Jesus looks at the big crowd and says, okay, boys, I understand that this is overwhelming. Let's break this thing down. I understand that the thought of feeding 5,000 scares you. So how about I ask you to feed 50? Can you handle that? And often in our lives, when there's a big need or a big debt or various needs, it gets overwhelming where I almost freeze up. Well, Jesus says, practically, break it down. Let's put some order. Let's look at what we have. And let's at least start on one. Let's at least feed the first 50. So in the natural, there are things that we can do for daily provision. We can look and see, Lord, what is in our hands. And if we face big problems, we can break it down and say, I'm not going to try and feed all 5,000, but can I just focus on this one area? Okay? And then we trust God that he works a bigger plan, 
that he'll give us wisdom to use what's in our hands. And there's something about when you start seeing momentum. Okay? It's like I'm meeting this need and it gives enables me to breathe a little. Now let's tackle the next 50. Okay, so there are natural ways that God wants to provide for you, very practical, and that's part of being a child of God. You're gifted and you're called. There are things that you can do with your time and your energy to generate income. And that's part of being children of God. Okay, but what do you do when that's not enough? When that's the only faucet you're aware of and it's still not enough? That's what happened with the disciples. Secondly, there's the people aspect, the relational. So let's remember that this started with a crowd of people following Jesus. They were pursuing him. They happened to get hungry at the end of the day, but they didn't come for physical food. They came because they wanted a relationship with him. That's why Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek. First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and there's your solution. All things will be added unto you. Also, Jesus was teaching them, which means he helped them with their mindset. Jesus was healing people, which means he cares about all of you. He cares about the whole you, spirit, soul, and body. So he cares about your needs financially, but he also, it's like when you find a job that pays the biggest salary you've ever earned, but you're completely miserable, that's not the best setting. God wants you to have a sense of purpose. Or you find a job that strains you so much, it pays well, but it just wears you out, and, you know, you're 40, and you look like you're 80. It's like, okay, that's not going to help us. So God cares about the whole you, spirit, soul, body, financially, mentally, emotionally physically and the people aspect the relational aspect is very big in the kingdom of God so we shouldn't be surprised that when it comes to our needs God has people in mind I thought of this example right now we're teaching little Lottie about sharing so let's say Lottie has a little play date and there's a friend there and we want them to have snacks and I take one of those cheese curls that they make by the way, they make some really good cheese curls for babies. And I have had cans of those by myself, and I'm thinking, man, these are some expensive cheese curls, but they really taste good right now. Okay, so I hand her one, and I'm like, here, little Lottie, give this to your friend. Now, as a child, her first tendency is going to be to keep it. Little girl, there's more than enough for everybody. I just need you to get in the habit of sharing. Everybody's going to have cheese scrolls, me included. We're going to all be happy. So could it be that at times God puts things in our hands just to help us in the process? That's what happened in this exchange. The bread and the fish, it people. Okay, so Old Testament, you see bread and meat raining down from heaven. Old Testament, you see God showing up in like unquestionable, miraculous ways. New Testament, you see a lot of God showing up through people. And there's a reason that that's changed took place. Now, God could have rained the bread down from heaven. He did it before. He can do it again. But in the new covenant, Christ in us, our hope of glory, he allows us to participate in the miracle. So look at how many people it took. It took the little boy. Jesus received it from the boy. Then Jesus gives to the disciples. The disciples give to the people. Somewhere in that group of 50, they had to be, I'm going to hand it out to you. Because it wasn't just, I'm first in line. I'm going to take all of this. So it's this mutual, God wants to provide for all of us through all of us. Has there been times in your life when God met a need through a natural way, through your job, through a salary, through overtime, through a bonus? Yes. Has there been times in your life when God met a need through a person? Yes. Has God ever used you 
to meet somebody else's need through you, a, a person. Yes. And that's going to continue. So our role in that is we still continue to seek God, seek His wisdom. How about we work on the kindness aspect and the relational piece? Because you never know when you might meet somebody again in the future. And maybe right now they're the person in need, and you're able to help them in a way. Well, guess what? There might come a day where you're on the other side. And the beautiful thing is that God speaks to his people. So you might be praying about your need. Somebody else that you never talked about, they asking God, show me what you want me to do today. And God saying, like me to the Lottie, here we go, child. I'm going to put this in your hand. Hand them that. Has that ever happened to you? Yes. Is that a beautiful exchange? Yes. And it's going to keep going. God provides through people. And that's why the relational divine connections are so important. Thirdly, there's the favor piece. There's the favor. Now, you see we're kind of moving from the natural way that's available to all people, regardless of their faith or belief or disbelief. And an unbeliever can work at a job and get a paycheck. True? Yes. But we're moving over into some of the kingdom life benefits available to us. That's why as children of God, we focus strongly on relationships and people. Bigger than just the financial need. Then there's the favor aspect. Now, favor is preferential treatment. It's not recorded, but in the story, there had to be a conversation where somebody went up to the boy and said, little boy, can we have your lunch? And the boy said yes. Because if we study anything about Jesus, he didn't snatch it from that boy. That's not how he operates. So this boy said yes. Another aspect of favor is here you find people that went to hear Jesus and they happen to be at the right place at the right time and they get a free fish sandwich that tasted well and fold them up. So this is favor. Favor is God's goodness on you that attracts people to you so that God can work through you. This is how favor works. You hear. We normally don't do this. But. Or. You know what? I spoke to my manager. And they said we can make an exception. That's favor. That's the favor of God. It's on your life. How can I say that? Luke 2.52 said Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And now Jesus is living in you, so you, as a child of God, increase in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. I've seen this so many times in my own life where the initial answer is no, or the policy says no. But then I pray about it, and the Lord says, ask, seek, knock. Never be intimidated by the first no. Because I have seen it so many times where you read the small print and it says, we cannot do it. But then that relational piece comes in. You go and talk to a person or you call and it happened to be somebody that you know or somebody that knows your family. And all of a sudden they say, you know what? We can make a plan. There is room to make exceptions. So that's favor where you see Petitions granted, policies and rules change. Just preferential treatment. Now, the favor faucet is not one that I can just wake up this morning and turn on. But what I can do is seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, grow, grow closer to Jesus, let Christ in me come alive. And if Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man, then I'll start recognizing favor. Have you ever been in a place where they first said no, 
And then they turned around and they said, we're willing to make an exception. So that's on your life, and that's one way that God provides for us. And then lastly, there is the supernatural, miraculous provision. Now again, ultimately, I'm trying to help you to look at your daily needs and not choke up because of fear and anxiety. Like, oh, we got to do the budget again. I hate it. I would rather just, you know, ignore this. But to get to a place where there's a need, I'm $10 short, I'm $1,000 short, I'm $100,000 short, Lord, help me not to be completely consumed with anxiety and fear. Give me wisdom to at least look at the problem, assess it, and then you help me to go to work in the natural, through relationships, seeing your favor. And then there is available to us heaven's supply. Now, if you're thirsty, you live in town, there is more water in that tank than you can ever drink. I don't care how thirsty you are. I don't care how much dishes you have to wash, or how much clothes you need to wash, or how many showers you like to take, or how long. There is more supply than your need. And that's true for heaven. Heaven is a place of abundance. So look what Jesus did. He tested them. He tested their hearts. And then he said, let me show you another way available that you might not be aware of right now. He looks up to heaven. He looks up to heaven. And then he speaks a blessing over what's in his hand. He said, this is what we have now. I'm going to pray over this. We're going to start with this. And then he just keeps giving. Now we see this example throughout scripture where somebody had to start small. I have a little bit of flour. I have a little bit of oil in the Old Testament. I give a little, and it just keeps going. So sometimes the miraculous happens, and we can almost miss it. Because what I read here, I do not read 5,000 hungry people and a bread, a, a mountain of bread. Okay? I don't read that in the story. I read one piece in Jesus' hand. He gives one piece. The disciples give. I love the fact that New Living says he kept giving. He kept giving. And that's how the supernatural work. Often, if you're not careful, you can miss it. Where I start by feeding this one. Okay, disciples, we know there are a lot of hungry people. Feed this one. Disciples, okay, I can give, I can hand this fish sandwich to this person. Next at the drive through Okay, I can hand the next one. And it just kept coming and kept coming and kept coming to the point that before they knew it, there was 12 baskets of leftover. There was abundance. Okay. Now, can we induce the supernatural? That's a question that I want to ask you. In your life, can you, is it up to you to make the supernatural happen? That's a very good question for all of us to ask. My answer is yes and no. I have a role to play, but ultimately only God can do the supernatural. But what I want you to see in all of this, there's something that you can do, and then there's God, I really need. So, God empowers you, you do what you can, yet at the same time, you are fully dependent on Him. It's like in the natural, applying for a job. Are there things that you can do to put you in the right position for a good career, a good job? Yes. But even with everything you do in the natural, you can have the best qualifications, best school, best degree. That doesn't guarantee you a position. Because you're going to interview and that's where the favor piece comes in. So it's like, Lord, I equip myself, but I need you. 
when it comes to people. I'm going to show your kindness, but I'm not going to manipulate people. Lord, you need if you want to provide through another person, then you need to speak to their heart. Same with a favor. I grow closer to you, Lord. I'm willing to ask. I'm willing to seek. I'm willing to knock. But you're the one who gives favor. Same with supernatural provision. Now, have you ever seen God show up and provide in ways that just leaves you breathless? I'm pretty confident you have. And I want you to think about this time because, again, if we're not careful, the, this crowd could have, somebody in the crowd could have just showed up, hear Jesus teach, see him perform miracles, get a sandwich, eat, go home. And miss the bigger picture of what just happened. I want you to know that God cares about the whole you. He cares about you spiritually. We know that. He cares about you mentally, emotionally. He wants you to be stable. He wants you to be at peace and at ease. He doesn't want you to be consumed with fear and anxiety. He cares about your emotional being. He cares about your physical needs. He does because he's a father. And a father means I provide. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And this morning, just think about a need that you might have in your life right now. And just think about when that need comes to mind, what emotions does that trigger in you? Is there a need in front of you right now that's, that's causing tremendous fear, tremendous anxiety? This morning, we collectively are going to take those needs to the Lord and ask Him bring his peace, to bring a sense of trust. Trust doesn't mean I've figured it all out. Trust means, Lord, I believe that you will make a way. Somehow, some way, somehow, my God will make a way. I'm going to ask you to just stand. Stand together and let's just use this as a visual. A visual, just think about whatever your need is right now and just think it's abstract, but let's think that we can hold it in our hands and now just hold that out to the Lord and basically say, Lord, this is my need, this is where there are 5,000 hungry people but I only have five loaves and two fish. This is where there's lack. Or this is an area where there is tremendous fear and anxiety. Just hold that out to the Lord. Just close your eyes again. Let me pray over you. Father, here we stand before you with our lives and our needs. We thank you that the Bible says that the Lord is our shepherd, and therefore we shall not want. The Bible says that our Lord supplies for all of our needs according to His riches and glory. Father, I want to pray for anybody in this place that's sensing a lot of stress, fear, anxiety, worry because of a current Right now, we bring that to you. We ask you to bring a sense of trust. To put us at rest that my God knows, my God will supply. We do what Jesus did. We look up to heaven. We look up to your abundant supply. We put our trust in Father, I pray for every person in this place. I pray for our daily needs. I pray that you will supply. 
forgive us this day. 